have a Bible, I want you to open it to 2 Thessalonians. It's going to be an important message today. They're all important, but this is a really important word. God wants to speak to us. I'm only going to read a few verses, and I'm going to shoot around to other passage. It says, speaks about the great apostasy that's approaching, and it speaks about the coming of the lawless one, which will happen I believe before the rapture of the church. That's how we'll know Christ is really coming. It says, because that day won't come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. It says that in verse uh, 3. And it goes on to say in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Father God, we ask that you just speak in our hearts today that you know where to get to our unbelief and our doubt and our fear and our hurts and our wounds. And Lord, we know that your word is able to save, deliver, and heal. Send forth your word in the power of the Holy Spirit this morning and do all those things, Lord. Save, heal, and deliver. Grant us in this hour the fear of God that we may know the urgency of the hour. In Jesus' name. I say that this, this reason God will send them a strong religion, they shall believe the lie. Speaks about people perishing who did not believe the truth. And, you know, there's, every age is described as something. The age of enlightenment, the age of, I don't know, what was that one? They so used to sing about Aquarius. That was the free love era. And we today, I believe, Clearly, we are living in the age of the lie. People lie. Governments lie. They manipulate. They spin. You saw that in COVID. Whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, I don't care. But there are a lot of lies told about what was happening, about the freedoms people had, about what was in certain medicines. And everyone was spinning and distorting and exaggerating. And our... And all that's being supported by media and our culture just now accepts it as the norm. We accept the, the lie is the norm. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to hear simple truth from our culture. Very hard just to hear a politician or a leader or an official tell the truth. I remember when I graduated from Bible college, the last thing, you think my professor would have said something profound. He stood up at the end and he said, remember this, tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And you can see that we're living in there. How, how do we know we're living in the age of a lie? I tell you, it's so evident before us because when a five-year-old boy thinks that he may not be a boy, that is a lie. You know, it's a lie. A boy is a boy, born a boy, and people now are becoming so confused because we are living in the era of the lie. The idea that the climate is going to destroy us all and we're all going to perish because we're all going to burn, that's a lie. It's a convenient lie that many believe. And all the LGBT community, all the trans community, all those people, all the cults have been ensnared by lies. That's a fact. Delusion. God will send a strong delusion and they should believe the lie. Many people today are believing lies. And lies ensnare people and stop people living the freedom and the good life God comes to give us because the Word of God tells us that only the truth makes us free. And the truth keeps us free. But increasingly, as I said, we're living in an 
anti-God society, anti-God governments that are trying to tell us righteousness is sin and sin is good. That's the world we live in. And it's getting worse and it's getting more prevalent. And uh, people are telling lies, but more importantly, people now are believing in lies and coming in captivity because they believe in lies. And if, if you we, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, because this chapter tells us what happens to individuals and cultures, entire societies, what happens when we choose willingly to believe lies. And uh, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood. Now, we'll stop there. And then it goes on to say, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us, that everyone knows that God is. How do we know that? It says that God has revealed himself to everyone in creation. You just cannot look at this world and really believe that nothing created everything. No one really believes that in their heart. God has revealed himself in a tree. Who else can make a tree like that? And all the beauty of creation and ocean. God has revealed himself to the world in creation. And nobody doesn't look at it. Maybe a blind man. Everybody sees it. And he says, he has revealed himself as God. And it says, so, therefore, we are without excuse. Because God has revealed himself as God. But then it says that people believe lies. goes on to say in verse 25, the people exchange the truth of God for a lie. And then it tells us why would somebody not want to believe in God, not want to believe the truth in the one who has so clearly revealed himself. And here it is. It says right there, there's not a million reasons. It's not because you're smart. It's not because you're more intellectual. It's not because that Christians are stupid. And here's the reason. The people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That means that although you know the truth, we prefer unrighteousness. So God's truth speaks, it's a moral truth, it speaks to our sin and our unrighteousness. And we don't want to hear what God has to say about sin and unrighteousness. We want to live lawlessly. We want to do what we want to do. Therefore, we suppress the truth. That's what's going on in every believer's heart. It's not that they don't know God. It's they know that God has a moral requirement and they don't want to live under it. So they suppress, they push the truth down. The truth that makes you free is pushed down in unrighteousness. And then it speaks about the consequences, what happens to individuals and whole cultures that, that, that go down that path. It says, first of all, They become futile in their thoughts. Proclaiming to be wise, they become fools. Why are they fools? Because when you reject God, there is judgment looming over you. After 70 years, you've got judgment. You don't even know it. How foolishness. You're only here for a short time in light of eternity. So foolish, they they think they're so wise with all our, our, our current ideology and our cleverness and our aborting, and we think we're so clever, but it's actually foolishness. And it says, people then exchange the truth for, for a lie. Verse 25 says, they worship the creature rather than the creator. Don't you know these days people are more concerned about the spiny 
speckled lizard than they are about the honor of God. You can't build anything because you may harm the speckled whatever it is, frog. They're more concerned about the speckled frog than they are in aborting children. More concerned. Foolishness. So they start to worship creation rather than creator. And then it says, if we keep going down that path and we keep refusing to acknowledge the truth and who God is and his moral requirements, the most frightening thing happens. It speaks about for the wrath of God is revealed under heaven against all unrighteousness and righteousness who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So we come under the wrath of God. When we continue to reject truth, we come under the wrath. Now, the wrath of God has a number of aspects. The wrath wrath of God first is eschatological. There's a time when God, like he did with Noah, will lose patience with all of humanity who reject him, and he will pour out his wrath. It's called the tribulation, and you don't want to be around then. You want to be in the rapture of the church. That's, re- that's eschatological. There's also the wrath of God which deals with consequences. The unbelievers call it karma. We call it sowing and reaping. That is the wrath of God. When you reap the consequences from your ungodly action, it's built into creation. God has built the world that way. But then there's a, there's a, there's a wrath of God which is called the abandonment of God. Three times in this passage, God says, those who keep rejecting the truth, therefore, verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, dishonoring their bodies. Verse 26, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged a natural use for what is against nature. Women burned in their lust for one another. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. So what happens to a culture? A culture which persistently rejects truth for the lie. Consistently rejects the word of God for worldly ideologies which are lies. And we know they're lies. We know a boy is a boy deep down. It's ridiculous. We know there's always been Sun sowing and harvest. And the Bible says there always will be springtime and harvest. So the world's not going to perish. We're not going to burn up. But he says there's, there's consequences. There's, and the consequences for a culture, when we persist and persist and persist in believing lies and choosing The lie, because, don't forget, we want to keep our sin. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In the end, it says God gives them over. What to? It speaks about first, uncleanness and the lust of their bodies and heart. So the Bible says when you sexually sin, you sin against your own body. So when a society and a culture is being given up by God and coming under the wrath of God, the first thing that happens there is a sexual revolution, and we experienced that in the 60s and 70s. That's when people started to abandon church, suppress the truth for a lie, so God says, right, you can have a sexual revolution which is going to damage everybody. Then second consequences of rejecting truth and coming under the wrath of God There it is. Uh, God gave them up to vile passions. Women burned in lust for one another. Homosexuality and specifically lesbianism is the second judgment of God on a culture which is choosing the lie instead of truth. And then thirdly, it says... And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things that are not not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, goes on to say more and more and more. So basically it says God then gives them over the third level of, of God's wrath and handing us over is that 
Verse 21 speaks for this. All become foolish in their thoughts. Their hearts were dark and professing to be wise, they became fools. And you have a debased mind. What is a debased mind? Debased mind is basically insanity. So we are living in a culture that is sexually perverse, uh, is now uh, proclaiming homosexual sexuality to be a virtue because we're under the judgment of God. And now we're insane because we're saying, I can identify as a puppy. It's, it's just insanity. But it is. And a little boy's not a boy. He could be a little girl. It's insanity. And you must know that's what it is because the world wants you to agree and governments want you to agree with ridiculous propositions. But it has always been insanity and it is still insanity. And it says those who keep proclaiming that, in the end says, knowing the righteous judgments of God, those who practice such things are diversing of death. But listen to this. Not only of the same, but also those who approve of them who practice them. So, you know, when we actually say, you know, all that stuff's a virtue, and then we approve of it, we also bring ourselves under the judgment of God. So, this passage speaks about how we all know there is a God, and the God has revealed the truth, and he's revealed the truth has a moral element to it. God has given us moral boundaries for our own good. And when we say, I want to reject all that and I want to suppress the truth for a lie, we live under the consequences. Our thinking becomes foolish. Uh, we become sexually immoral. And we, and we believe all this nonsense ideology. And it ends up in insanity. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of our society is today. It's, it's actually believing in, ins in, ins in, ins in insanity. But the reason is because we reject God's truth. And there's a picture, I believe, a prophetic picture in, uh, about what will happen to a culture that continually persists that. Samson was a man who was supernaturally empowered by God. You know, with his hair, and he could pull down, you know, defeat armies with a jawbone, and he was supernaturally strong. The reason he was supernaturally strong was because God made him strong, and God was with him. And then uh, Samson became immoral, and God disciplined him because he chastens his children. And he allowed his hair to be cut, and he lost his strength. But the truth was he then repented and his strength was coming back when he was in prison. They gouged out his eyes, put him in prison, the Philistines. But God, because he's a merciful God, was bringing his strength back. But the Philistines, it says this, the Philistines believed our God, their God was Dagon, had delivered Samson into our hands, Samson our enemy. And they're standing in this temple the day Samson regained his strength and he was about to push the pillars of the temple over and destroy more people in death than he did in life. And these people are all standing together believing a lie. They are believing that Dagon, our false god, really is the one who captured Samson rather than God handing him over. And so they're all standing in the masses, all together, believing a lie. But just because it's popular, popularity will never validate a lie. And in the end, there they are, standing in agreement with their lie, which was very popular, and they died and were crushed under the truth. That's what happens to a culture. Ultimately, that will refuse and continually refuses the truth of what God has proclaimed. So if we are living in a culture that is like that, and we are, we are living in a culture which is believing lies, proclaiming lies, and a, 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 a culture which thinks their lies will protect them, what? are you to do as a believer, 
as someone who knows the truth. Bob Dylan sung a song, In a World Full of Lies. How, what do we do? Well, firstly, the Word of God tells us that we are endued. It speaks about liars and false teachers, and it says we are to contend for the faith. So that means you're not to be dismayed. Joshua was told, you're going to take the land. Do not be dismayed, because it's very easy to be dismayed and say, my goodness, the whole world has gone after these lies, and we as believers are just so outnumbered. We're not to, we're not to, not to be dismayed, but we are to contend. That means fight for the truth, contend for the faith. Secondly, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, so John chapter 8, and Jesus was saying that Satan is the father of lies, but I am the truth. Jesus is the truth, and he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. As you abide in my word, the truth will make you free. And that tells us one thing. Jesus, truth is a person. Jesus, everything about him was true. Everything he said was true. He never exaggerated, even the way he dressed. It was, he was completely true, and he is the truth. He is the truth, and he is the word of God as well, the word that became flesh. And he said, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you and keep you free. And so he says, you didn't say you will know a truth. He will say you will know the truth. So you must know there is only one truth. It's Jesus. He is the Word of God. And it's not subjective like there is one law of gravity. And I don't care. You know, you can say, these people that say like, I'm speaking my truth. There, there is not your truth. There is truth or there is a truth. Because you can, people today, they think, well, if I say it, I can make it true. You can say, I'm Superman. That's my truth. But I tell you, you go out in Central Coast Highway today and you stand in front of a truck, you're going to understand that your truth is not reality and real truth is ultimate reality. Truth is reality. And Jesus says, you'll know the truth and the truth that makes you free is ultimate reality, and the only ultimate reality is found in His Word. And you've got to understand, the, the, there's a passage in, in Romans 3 that says, let God be true and every man a liar. If, this, if, if, if someone says something, or a government says something, or a group says something, and it doesn't line up with this Word, it's not the truth, and it's a lie. And Satan is the father of lies. And he is prince of this world. And he produces ideologies that he wants you to get entrapped by. But he is the father of lies. And if it's not truth, it is a lie. So we are to contend for the faith. And we are to know the truth. Now... The Bible also tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. And I emphasize the love bit because some believers have made a mess of things by speaking the truth. They know the truth, but they don't speak in love. And there's a passage I, I, I draw our attention to in, in John chapter, oh, sorry, Mark chapter 8, when Jesus met this rich guy. He's called the rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus and he said, I want to know how to get eternal life. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He answered and said, teacher, I've done all these things from my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, whatever you have and give to the poor. Say what you have, give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Here it is. This is Jesus meets this guy and he says, I, I'm a, I, I think I'm a good person. And he's thinking, my good deeds are going to get me to heaven. And your good deeds will never get you to heaven. We're saved by faith. It's when we put our faith in Jesus who's the only good and righteous one, knowing that we, our best efforts are 
are tarnished. And when we believe in him, we are saved. This man believed good deeds could save him. Now, there's plenty of people today who believe that you can be saved apart from Jesus Christ. You can receive eternal life by being a good person, doing lots of charitable things. Now, look, this man had that thought, and he was pretty good. He was a pretty good guy. But it says, Jesus loved him and said to him, because Jesus knew this guy loved money. And, and the Word of God says, you cannot love God and money. So Jesus looked at him, loved him, and told him the truth. Said, go sell everything because you love money. Follow me, give it to the poor, and follow me. So basically, Jesus is looking at him, and he's telling him the truth, saying, you are deceived, you love money, and you can't love money in God. Now, in telling this guy the truth that would give him eternal life, Telling him the truth hurt his feelings. Because it says, this guy went away very sad at this word. And to tell people the truth will sometimes hurt their feelings. He, he had his feelings hurt. But we must tell the truth even if it does hurt people's feelings. And the reason I say that today is that we live in a society where increasingly hurt feelings are associated with hate. Institutions are training our young people that, you know, there was a time when I grew up, we used to tolerate debate. We used to tolerate differences. We used to respect one another. You could have a respectful argument. But now, if you disagree on something to do with gender or whatever, you are psychologically damaging me. You are causing me harm. If you have an eternal, if you have an alternate view on sexuality or whatever, climate, you're a hater. And you're, you're, if you disagree, you're violating me and you're hurting me and you're harming me. And people come under that. So we stop speaking the truth. But Jesus spoke the truth, hurt his feelings because he loved him and he didn't want him to miss eternal life through the love of money. And sometimes, you know, it's called tough love. We have to tell people hard truths that are hurtful. Yes, we do. One of the disaster with childhood edu education, we have raised a generation in education where we are, the only thing we want to do is preserve the feelings of the children. So when I used to go to school, and I'm giving up my age, it was a long, long time ago, you got a prize if you excelled and you were the best. You had excellent achievement, you got a prize. But now I go to school, everybody's got to get the prize. It's true. All the kids, whether you're a high achiever or not, you get the prize. And we tell our children that if you just want it enough, if you want it, you can do and you can become anything. We don't talk about the hard work and the discipline and the graft. We just say, if you imagine it, you can become it. And we tell them all that they're all very special. And then the trouble is they go to work. <laughs> and they get into a workplace and they realize... I'm one in a hundred. I'm not very special. Because special means that you stand out. And also, I realize that I'm not going to get promoted without achievement. I'm not going to get prizes without excelling. And then I realize I actually can't do or be anything without a heck of a lot of graft, discipline, hard work, persisting. And so we have a generation 
who have been raised on a lie, who now have to medicate with antidepressants. Why? Because we haven't told them the truth for fear of hurting their feelings. But the truth that makes free sometimes hurts feelings. But this is what we need to do. We need to make sure Jesus didn't just speak it regardless of the consequence. He loved him. That's why the Bible says we are to hold out and speak the truth in love. And how do you know you're speaking the truth in love? Just like you're not speaking the truth if you just want to win an argument or get your, get your point of view of cross and be proven right. That's not speaking the truth in love. And I've seen Christians do that. But what we do when we're speaking the truth in love, the motivation is the good of the person. The motivation is, I've got something that's going to free you. I know that you're trapped. And I've got a word here. I can see what's stopping you progressing. I have got a word that's going to make you free. And I want to give it to you because I love you. Because I want the best for you. That has to be the motivation of the Christian. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This, this question, this, this passage is often quoted a little bit, a little bit out of uh, context. And Paul says this, he said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting out arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. See the word there? It says, for the, we're in a war. For though we walk, we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. It speaks about weapons, and then it speaks about stronghold. The, 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 the better translation today for stronghold is a fortress. In the, in the days of Paul, when conquering armies would go through a land, they would, uh, even if they were conquered, they would rebuild fortresses on high grounds. And, uh, and he's basically saying here, we have weapons for pulling down fortresses. And he's speaking in terms of spiritual war and Satan's fortresses. And what, what the fortresses are, they are the lies people believe. So that, that when people believe a lie, they get taken into captivity into Satan's fortress. So they're held in captivity. Their lives can't thrive. And what are the fortress? What are Satan's lies that take people in captivity? Today, it's gender ideology. It's philosophies. It's ideologies. It's psychologies which are against the Word of God. And unfortunately, some of them are even in the church. And they, when we come into agreement with these philosophies, with these ideologies... You know, I've, I've even heard pastors saying, if you're not preaching climate change today, you're a dinosaur. <laughs> it's the truth. Now, I think we should be good stewards of the planets. But the Bible says in 2 Chronic Chronic Chronicles 2.13, when people sin, it affects the planet. The solution is repentance. Not buy an electric car. But these are ideologies that you may be a, you may, you're born with a penis, but you may be a girl. That is an ideology. And if you come into agreement, Satan takes you captive. And we see people today, how you've got to see people, people that are believing that, you must see them as captives. So he speaks about fortresses, people being taken into these fortresses, and we are in a spiritual war. And because people have become captives through these ideologies. 
And our goal as the armies of Christ is to destroy the ideologies. And the way we destroy the ideology, we want to destroy the ideologies so people are freed from Satan's fortresses. And the way we destroy the ideologies, which are Satan's fortresses, is by proclaiming the truth. And the more you are able to articulate truth in the power of the Holy Spirit, the more damage you do to Satan's fortresses. That's why we must know the truth and boldly proclaim the truth, even if you're hated, even if people rejected you. Many people, before they get free, have got to hear the truth numerous times. But every time we proclaim the truth, we are doing spiritual warfare and we are destroying d d demonic ideologies and strongholds which are holding people captive. And we have to proclaim that in love. Every time you say it, you're damaging the fortress. Every time you speak it, you're damaging the fortress. Now, some of those ideologies have even... Jude speaks about some of them even coming into the church. In the, the last book before Revelation, the, Jude tells us, he's speaking to, to false things that have come in the church, false teaching, false prophets, and he said, we are to contend earnestly into the faith because there are some people who turn the grace of our God into lewdless. Yeah, and, and then it goes on to say, these same teachers are mockers in the last time, are walking according to their ungodly lust. They are sensual peoples and not having the spirit causing the visions. Now, there are some even people in the church today who do not believe the word of God is eternal. They do not believe it's infallible. And so they're coming into the church. That's why we're having, you know... Um, all sorts of people ordained in these other denominations and, uh, and people saying that, well, you know, uh, there's all the, the only two scriptures some people know is don't judge and there is no condemnation. And they turn, uh, this happened in the book of Jude. It was happening then when Paul says they're turning the grace of God into lewdness. And we think we're forgiven, we're forgiven, we're forgiven. We can do whatever we like because we're under the blood of Jesus and we're not called to a righteous life, we're just forgiven over. It's like, no, 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 no. They've been taken by, by demonic ideology as well. They've been in Satan's fortress as well, even though they're in the church and we need to proclaim the truth. And I've been proclaiming the truth. I, I, I'm not a motivator. My job as a pastor is not to motivate, just to proclaim truth. And I've been doing it for 28 years. And I want to tell you, if you do... Sometimes you'll be hated. Yes, you will. Sometimes you're going to offend people, but it's not you. It's the gospel. The gospel is an offense. If people choose to suppress the truth and they want to stay there under the judgment, they can become very offended with you. And it's becoming harder and harder, but the church needs to be bold. We need to be bold. The Bible speaks about being light in the world is holding out the word of truth which saves. The only thing that's going to get people out of the satanic fortresses are the people who have the truth. That's why we know Jesus is the hope of the world, but so are you. I finished. I'm not going to preach long today. Isaiah 28, I believe this is what God wants us to hear. From verse 14, Isaiah 28, Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, who rule the people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Shalom, Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us. We have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Does that speak about our time today? We have made lies. That we, we're trusting in these ideologies. We believe they're going to save us. Uh, you know, I, I, I said there's a, you know, our gospel is that we've got a sin nature. And there's nothing I can do to save myself because God is holy and he'll only, only expect, he'll only accept perfect righteousness. And I can't. Be perfectly righteous because I've got a sin nature. 
So what he did out of love, he sent Jesus who lived perfectly righteousness for me and then he was sacrificed for all my unrighteous acts and all I have to do is believe in him, abandoning trust in myself, but putting all my faith in his life and his death to save me before a holy God and I'm saved. That's the good news. And that's the truth. But I saw in COVID, there's a new gospel coming for. You know, it's only believing in the blood of Jesus. And it's only by trusting in his blood and his life, his righteous life, that I am found to be righteous. But now I saw in COVID a new righteousness. It was like, if you get vaccinated, you're a loving person. And if you get an electric bike, you love the planet. And by doing all these virtuous things, you are a righteous person. It'll never make you righteous. The only thing that makes you righteous is the blood of Jesus and trusting in his life and his death for me. Everything else, anything else you trust in, you are trusting in a refuge of lies and you're hiding yourself under falsehood. But this is what I believe. That passage goes on to say, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. That is Christ, the cornerstone. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also make justice the measuring line, a righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters will overflow the hiding place your covenant of death will be annulled. And I believe that speaks about a time after Christ where people again are believing in lies. They're making lies their refuge, but God is going to do something. He's going to lay a cornerstone. That, we know that is Christ. And it says those who believe him and, and not act hastily will sweep. It says the hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. What, what is that? I believe that we're on the cusp of a revival where people are trusting in these demonic ideologies, these lies of Satan, that the hail is God's people proclaiming truth. As we proclaim the truth in love, as we discover a new spirit of boldness and speak out and not be intimidated and come under this nonsense, that as we speak it, every word becomes hail that damages and sweeps away those lies and brings people out of their fortress and brings people out of their captivities. The word of God comes when we proclaim it in the power of the Spirit as the hail which sweeps away all lies. And I believe that's what God wants to do in this generation. What was that song we were singing this morning, Michelle? About the truth. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. It's onward Christian soldiers marching. To, how's it go? There's something. We were singing it in the car. <laughs> Someone will know it and they'll tell it to me very, very soon. The truth is marching on. That's the church. And I believe, I believe the church in many ways has lost confidence just in the Word of God. The, the, the church has become weakened by these, these ideologies are all around us, the lies that people are trusting in. And in many places, the church has lost its nerve. And you saw that like in times like when we have a plebiscite. The truth is, it's not good for a man to marry a man. God says that because he wants our best. And he gives us boundaries to keep us whole. But so much of the truth in the church, in the plebiscite, said we're not going to say anything because we're going to lose people. Where the church is meant to be the conscience of the nation. And we are meant to be the people who know the truth and see anyone who is not living in it is in a fortress. They're in captivity. 
They are trusting in a refuge of lives. But we have the solution to free them. And as we proclaim the truth and articulate the truth, the fortresses get damaged. And the hail of the truth comes and begins to sweep away the lies. It may not happen overnight, but if we continue to proclaim it, captives get free. And I believe that's, what, that's the revival that God wants to bring. It's a revival of the truth. And maybe you're someone here and you, you know, do, do you know what it is to be, maybe you've never experienced glorious freedom. You know, the, the, the biggest lie that people come into agreement with that keeps them captive, this is the biggest lie people believe, is that freedom makes you free. That is, if I can just live doing whatever I want to do, freedom without bounds, I'm free. No, you see, people who get into drugs and people get into alcohol, they think, I'm free. And after a while, I think, I don't, I, I don't have to live under the restraints of God or my parents. I'm free to do all this. And I, so they pick up the alcohol. They pick up the drugs and they think they're free to do it. But after a while, instead of you having the drugs, the drugs have you. Because Satan is narcissistic and vindictive. He'll give you that stuff, but it doesn't bring freedom. It brings bondage. Absolute freedom within it brings bondage. But what makes you free, truly free and glorious free, is the truth and Jesus said, I am the truth. The freest people, most joyful people are believers, Christians. And if you are not free, you know you're not free. You're not thriving. You need to come to the truth that will make you free and commit your life to Him today. Because He wants you to be free. He wants you to live a good, prosperous life. He doesn't want you in bondages and addictions and pornographies and anger that's ongoing. He wants to set you free from fear and anxiety and guilt and shame. He wants to make you free. And he says, he who comes to, the, to, to me will not only be free, but free indeed, which means gloriously free. Are you gloriously free? You need to come to Jesus. He wants to do something for you today. I don't know who it is, but there's someone here today. You're not free. God loves you, and He brought you here to come under the Word. You have trusted in lies. God says He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to save you from those lies. He wants to forgive you and wash you clean and save you. But you need to give yourself to Jesus, who is the truth. Truth is, without Him, you can't be saved. Truth is, the other side of that truth, all who call on His name will be saved. If that's you, you do that today. Let's stand up and praise Him. You're reading the Word that keeps you free. You need to in this generation, in this time, because the Word makes you free, but it keeps you free. If you don't feel free, someone will pray for you today. It's Jesus. Jesus makes us free. Amen. Let's praise Him.